Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 156th session of the online Optom Learning Series, OOLS. And for today's session, we have with us Dr. Stuti Mishra. Uh, Dr. Stuti is an optometrist scientist working as a senior lecturer in the Department of Ophthalmology, the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And her research areas include anterior segment imaging, ocular surface diseases, and corneal innervation in systemic diseases as well. She has uh, been awarded and has been recipient for several awards, which includes the Fulbright New Zealand Travel Award and also the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award as well. And Dr. Stuti wrote to me a couple of uh, months ago and, you know, she's been uh, our speaker for one of the sessions before and she said that she would like to share some more uh, details about her research work and her clinical experience. So we said, let's just schedule it. And today she's going to talk to us about confocal and specular microscopy of the cornea, how clinically it is important and share her experience with us. So welcome Dr. Stuti on uh, to our platform again. And, uh, you know, let me just leave the screen time to you. Thank you, Fakradeen. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, I am. Um gave uh, Ul's lecture last year in the middle of pandemic. It was July last year, I think. Um, and uh, we have been so used to Zoom now at that stage, we were getting used to it, but now I think we have championed it. So I thought, yeah, why not? We saw Auckland, New Zealand has been in lockdown for four months, which ended just two days ago. Um, so yes, yeah, so one of the days I thought, uh, why not give another lecture? And confocal and specular microscopy, it's becoming quite a common uh, tool um, in clinical settings. So uh, I thought it's it's an uh, apt time to, to do that. Okay, so when we hear about, um, you know, technology, we're often too afraid to use anything new, especially if uh, the so-called new technology has been around for a while. We can, well, we hear about confocal or specular microscopy. So they have been around for a while, uh, perhaps not at every practice or every country, but increasingly worldwide. So because it's been in use for mm, a decade or oh, much over a decade, it's um, it's almost, you, people find it scary. We can't, we don't wanna ask because it's you're supposed to know it already as an optometrist. So in today's um, lectures, 40, 45 minutes or so, i uh, briefly mention, uh, discuss about these microscopes, uh, confocal and specular microscopes. Um, and uh, by whether they are just diagnostic, research or both. Um, and uh, if you could use these images or imaging technology to monitor progression of corneal disease or ocular surface disease uh, or for surgery and also whether you can use that for any systemic diseases and other diseases as well and other conditions, not just diseases. So before I go any further, I'd like to do a call just to see, because I know that a lot of you are students there. So Fakrudin, um, if you could uh, launch poll, if that's okay, thank you. So I'll just give you, um, maybe 30 seconds or so um, in, uh, it could be a guess if you have never seen, used or knew or heard about this, that's totally fine. Um, but just just take a while, guess. Yes, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of uh, something which we learn in optometry school as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the question is, uh, which equipment is the best to use for visualization of the corneal endothelial cells and uh, four options you have, uh, as Dr. Stuti mentioned, if you are new to it, just take a wild guess. So yeah. majority of them are saying specular microscope. Uh, mm -hmm. People do say that confocal microscopes and slit lamp uh, as well, but nobody mentioned about anterior segmentosity at this point of time. Okay, that's uh, that's good. That's really good to see everyone actually... Um, no one said ASOCT, anterior segment OCT, because that is quite um, quite a popular tool these days. Uh, but you're absolutely right. You don't actually see endothelial cells um, using ASOCT. 
slit lamp you could if you are an experienced clinician you could potentially see using specular reflection um, and if it is um, if you are um, normal then it's much more harder to see but if it's uh, if it's in a in a Fuchs dystrophy or in an abnormal cornea or endothelial dystrophy you could potentially see it um, so let's start uh, just keeping that in mind. I'll discuss all the other options, uh, other answers you gave throughout this uh, lecture. But we'll go through um, the talk first. Right? Um, so um, this is, of course, everyone, all of you know uh, what this is. This is um, ocular surface, layer by layer. Um, so this was redrawn by one of my uh, honor students. Um, I'm not, uh, it, I'm sure there are a lot of students, but I'm sure you all know what these layers are. Uh, what uh, all confocal microscope specially uh, does, it scans the cornea and records all these layers, layer by layer. So each cell, so you could see visualized cells in each layer. Um, and we are also we are interested specifically in uh, subbase and nerve plexus. So I'm not only going to talk about um, just the, all the cell uh, cells, but also nerves that are in your cornea. So that's where the subbasal nerve plexus is located. Um, so this is um, uh, a cross section again, uh, just a diagrammatic dis, uh, interpretation by Andrea Cruzat, uh, and it's, it nicely says where these epithelial layers, the three epithelial layers. Bowman, subbasal, and then we have the stroma. And of course, then you have base maze and endothelium. So what in vivo confocal microscopy does, so in vivo means in hu living human cornea. So you can scan it as an, in patients, in your, most of your patients. So um, it is said non-invasive, but of course you anesthetize the eye. And it's almost like measuring um, IOP using Goldman tonometry. So it, it feels like that. So you anesthetize the eye, both eyes, because you want your eyes to be open. Uh, and then using, uh, you put uh, a coupling medium as polygel, and then a thermal cap, which is essentially a plastic cap. Uh, so that's, again, almost like an interface. And then you have on top, you put very thin layer of polygel, or uh, I tend to use, uh, which is something that's not as viscous, so just any uh, lubricant is just fine. And you scan the cornea, and it takes um, about two minutes to scan uh, overall, because there, uh, there's a lot of buttons, but it seems complicated, but it's actually quite straightforward. The image that it takes is about 400 by 400 microns. So it's quite tiny, of course, so we all know what corneal diameter is. So of course, this uh, each image is extremely magnified. Um, if you are to do montages or nerve maps, that then scanning takes a bit longer, say about 10 minutes, because you want to scan a larger area. So we, the scanning is done, of course, from anterior to posterior, but on um, so these nerve plexus, you can scan it in a wider area. So it will become clear when I talk about in the next few slides. So firstly, let's uh, briefly look at what principle it's working on. Um, so this is so HRT2 and HRT3. So that's HRT, just the Heidelberg, it's just the uh, company name, Germany-based. Um, so these are laser scanning and focal microscopes. So what it happens is, as uh, so you can see my uh, pointer there, so a light beam, it passes through um, a light source, through a percher, and then it's focused on an objective lens um, into a small focal within the cornea, within the specimen, which means that's, that's the cornea. And the, a mixture of emitted as well as reflected light from the illuminated spot is recollected by the uh, objective lens. So it's false and it goes back um, and uh, in, it, into the detection uh, apparatus. So this is then you have back into the detection apparatus there. And after passing through the pinhole, so I'm sure you all know what a pinhole is. Um, the light is detected by the photo detection uh, device. So then you have the detection. So again, it comes in and then it's going back and the detector aperture obstructs the light that is not coming from the focal point 
and that results in a sharper image. So it seems complicated, but essentially what's happening, the light is coming and then it is going back. So it's confocal. It's uh, the confocal, as it names the gist, it's uh, the focal, it's doing a dual, dual thing. It's almost, uh, so to speak. Um, but if it's, it's just for those who want to understand the principles, but if you, you don't have to. It's just, it becomes easier to understand uh, when you understand the principle, um, then it's easier to know where, why you see clear images in certain types of microscopes and in some results. So this is laser scanning. And I'll talk about slit scanning as well and also uh, specular microscopes and the next few slides. So firstly, let's stick to uh, confocal uh, microscopy. So it's um, so it's from the core, from epithelium through to these nerves, stroma, and then the endothelium. So it records all these images directly into the system. And as I said, this is 400 by 400 microns. So not just um, epithelium as one layer. So we know even epithelium has multiple cell types. So it can tell, so you've got superficial cells, upper wing cells, low wing cells, and basal cells. So it can record all of these um, throughout and until endothelium and even deeper layer of deeper layers of stroma as well. Um, so this one uh, here, J, so this is an oblique scan. So if it's uh, not done in to posterior, when you have an oblique scan, that's when you see all of these layer in one go. Um, and of course, this one, this is uh, 3D reconstruction, how it's supposed to, the whole cornea is uh, imaged essentially. Um, and this is an example of Z stack. So then you have different layers and you can uh, uh, do a lot of image processing to, um, to understand what's happening in different diseases in different states um, that I'll talk about. In terms of cell basal nerve plexus, um, that's, that can be a bit challenging to image, but once you, um, it, it is very much possible with, um, with practice. And then what you, you're looking at a few different things, not just how, not just the density, which is obviously the most common thing you do, but also presence of any neuromas. So what are these neuromas? So these are uh, the nerve endings. They generally appear at periphery, but in um, certain states, like in this is, this is an example of Pony Alodaya, uh, that's uh, noticed, that's reported by again, Andrea Cruzard's paper. Um, and then toshosity, uh, toshosity is, um, so you've got straight lines, so short seems how much they are bending essentially, and certain diseases you do see hydrochosity as well. Nerve loss, that, that's an obvious one, you lose nerves. Um, and you have beading. So what is beading? You see these um, dots around here. So they are saying beads. So you know what beads are. So your nerves looks like there are a lot of beads around your nerves. Um, reflectivity. Um, so high reflectivity is also a sign. Um, it is reported by several researchers that it is a sign of abnormal cornea. And nerve regeneration. So in, a, in, a certain, in diseases, you, you're we can see regeneration, especially for surgery. Okay, so a measurement of nerve density, that's again um, done by, uh, you can do it in a semi-automated way using uh, imaging, free imaging software that I'm sure most of you know is image J, uh, neuron J, that's freely available. Um, there's another automated software is ACC metrics. Um, that can be used as well. Um, again, it's everyone has a uh, different preference what they want to use. Um, so what it does is you can just trace the, uh, each nerve and it directly saves into the system. And that can be done, as I said, in image and ACC metrics and another software that we have developed with uh, American counterparts. Um, that's again, I'm not talking about that. That's you can refer to my other talk, if you like, that I'll mention at the end as well. I briefly mentioned about um, montages or nerve maps. So what is that? So when you scan uh, these nerves, so to scan the a larger area, so you in different areas, so not just scanning through from anterior to posterior, but staying within that layer, 
you can uh, do multiple scanning or multiple images and then rearrange them. And it's like a jigsaw puzzle. So what, why we do that, it will become obvious. So we prepare a nice contiguous montage or and, and a large nerve map. So again, why is that important? So we see the nerves are sort of parallel in central cornea. And when it goes to inferior central, these are forming nice and estenosing networks. So they're almost coming together. Why is that important? Again, that uh, these change in a disease cornea, especially keratoconus, and I'll talk to you about that as well. So again, these nerve fibers, they are in a radiating pattern and they form a network and they migrate from periphery to inferior central. So generally when we scan, we scan central cornea. And in HRT, uh, two or three both have a side camera as well. So it's easy to orientate yourself to scan at the right place. Um, in terms of endothelial, so we're not just doing uh, uh, the thelium surveys and also, of course, deeper layers as well. Endothelium is, of course, one of them. You can, within the software, within um, the instrument, you have a uh, software that can do um, automated, fully automated or semi-automated um, endothelial cell density as well. So again, in raw images, you can use um, either of these methods. Um, to get density. Now to slit scan on confocal microscope. So this is again um, still confocal microscope, but this is slit scan. Nowadays it's not uh, as commonly used as it used to be. Um, but uh, so this is the principle uh, explained here. Uh, so what's happening? So when the white light, as you expect, so it passes through the first pin hole. And it's focused on in the cornea uh, by the condensing lens. And returning light, then it is diverted through the objective lens and a conjugate exit pinhole and reaches the observer or camera. So you, I will show you how it looks like. And the scattered out of focus light from below or above the focal lens. So this is as it's shown in the vocal lines here. It's greatly limited by the pinholes, and then it, then it, they, that that part doesn't reach the observation system. So again, kind of a similar, essentially similar principle, but that one is using laser, and images tend to be more clearer, as you can appreciate in these images here. So you've got you can see the nerves, you can see the keratocytes. However, when it comes to endothelium, they are much more clearer in slit scanning compared to laser scanning. Another difference is, as I was saying, you can uh, put this poly gel and then there's a tomocap in a HRT in the, in the laser scanning, but in slit scanning, you don't have that. So you have um, the, uh, it, just the poly gel and that's, that's the couple of medium and that directly goes onto the cornea. Um, of course, as I said, similar to um, your laser scanning, your eyes is anesthetized. Um, and um, yeah, both eyes should be anesthetized and it's, it doesn't take too long to scan again, just uh, under a minute essentially, it's, that is pretty quick. But then of course it's scanning from interior through to stroma. So that can be automated as well. That can be set on automated mode because it does uh, the scan and then you can uh, just Keep an eye on it, very much similar to what you do in specular microscopy, which will come shortly. Okay, now, so um, so this is, again, this as you have uh, within the software, this tool to measure endothelial cell count, you have then the laser scanning in HRT, you have in confo scan on this or slit scanning too. So this slit scanning is the type of microscope ConfoScan is the name of the microscope. And uh, it's just if I use different terms, it's just that. They're just the HRT is the, again the brand name. ConfoScan is the brand name. Um, or MyDeck is the brand name. And ConfoScan is the name of it to avoid confusion. Um, so endothelial cell counts, again, this is the inbuilt software. Uh, what it's doing, it can be done in uh, automated. Um, you can, of course, do a bit of manual adjustment 
as well so for greater accuracy uh, in my personal experience you can if you uh, especially if there is minor abnormality when you have manual adjustment of cell borders then it gives it greater accuracy and if you look closely you can see the number of cells and the area it measures and also um, the, the cell area, so how many microns is actually measuring here. Okay, now for the specular microscopy. Specular microscopy is much more simpler, and of course it's non-invasive, it doesn't touch the eye, it don't need to anesthetize the eye at all. So it's much more easier, convenient, and can be used at, uh, for, for several people. And um, uh, in terms of training, it, the training is quite quick as well. Um, so again, uh, so a slit of light, I'm sure you must know of this already, it's quite similar to what specular reflection that you do uh, is. So specularly reflected light, rays are focused onto the camera and uh, to capture the image of endothelial cells. So you've got uh, the incident rays, but it's uh, straightforward, and then you have the reflected ray as well. So. It is a much more simpler process that's happening. But then again, remember, this is only capturing endothelial cell layer. But we do need endothelium, good, good health of endothelium, um, which is required in several, um, uh, not just uh, for endothelial health, but normal corneal health endothelium is quite important. So that's how the images that uh, it looks like. It gives you central corneal thickness, CD, so that's just the density, cell density. So as you know, the approximately the normal 2,500, 2,700, that would be normal, and um, it could reduce, of course, post cataract surgery, or but it, of course, bounces back, and uh, which I'll talk about uh, shortly as well. Um, so uh, again, looking at... Uh, Within the software, within the image, if that's that gives you raw image again, fully automated. That's and but you can also choose it to be semi-automated method or fully manual method as well. Now, where do we use these for the, all these tools that are at your disposal? Um, so this is uh, the so these are the examples. Uh, these are the images from. Uh, slit scanning confocal microscope. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about certain conditions, dystrophies. What are these specifically? That's uh, beyond the scope of this almost one hour uh, lecture. So I'll briefly mention what each of these are. But if you want to know more about each of them, you'll I'm sure there are a few, some of them already have had Ool's lecture. Uh, on the topic, um, but yeah, I can answer those questions at the end if you like briefly. Um, so on the on A, we've got um, epithelial basement uh, me membrane dystrophy, as the name suggests. It's epithelial dystrophy. You can see uh, it's hard to see the epithelial layers there. So you can see a sharp edge abnormalities, and um, so in in B abnormal nerves, you can clearly see that much they're much reduced numbers and also they're quite torturous. Uh, C, you've got early keratoconus where is activation of anterior most uh, layer of stroma. Um, as you can see in high reflectivity and keratocyte uh, nuclei and hazy extracellular matrix you can see. So again, that will become more clear when you do laser scanning microscopy, which I'll show examples of as well. D, you've got uh, clumps of bright leaflets, so these dots and these micro dot deposits in posterior most layer of stroma, and that's flake dystrophy. Oak dystrophy is actually quite a common one, again, most common one. So you can see microbole uh, in basal epithelium, and then endothelial gatate and uh, endothelial cell layer. You can see these dots. Keratoconus, as I was mentioning in that one, uh, you saw those uh, stroma layers. Couldn't see the nerves, but here what the nerves look like. You can see they are much more tortuous and potentially reduced in numbers as well. That's really important. 
So remember I talked about those nerve maps. Um, it seemed like a lot of work. So that's how so I, um, these can be traced. Uh, so I tra uh, this, this is one of my paper, it's one of my colleagues. Um, and uh, these, the central ones, central uh, nerves are parallel, and then you have the inferior central, that vortex region where, where all the nerves come together. In keratoconus, as you can see, if you look central cornea, that's extremely tortuous, and it's almost forming at, uh, these, this pattern at base of the cone, at base of the keratoconus. Um, so when you do the map, so that those, that those were the tracings, and these are the actual maps. So if you look at these nerves, they are sitting just, the nerves are sitting just right there at base of the cone. Um, most of you will be more familiar with this topographical images. So where, what when you superimpose with these nerve maps, um, you can see, uh, so that was the one I showed you before. You can see, um, again, at base of the cone, things start, uh, they're forming a pattern. Again, these are different types of um, keratoconus. So what happens in uh, collagen cross like things? So that's, again, um, a common um, treatment modality intervention that's used for keratoconus. Um, so, so why are these important? So not just to, um, to see what's happening, but to identify or determine exactly at what point treatment or intervention is needed. Um, so of course you can do progression in terms of topography, but what's happening in terms of now or at a cellular level. Um, so looking at this after cross-linking, you can see different layers and it's seeing the classic, the honeycomb appearance that you see after um, cross-linking. Let's go to deeper layers, so, um, foods dystrophy. This is again, uh, one of the common dystrophies that we see in endothelium. Um, so you've got, uh, so as we know, endothelium maintains proper fur level in cornea. But during disease progression, so the layer of these layer cells responsible to maintain this, they sort of, they form tiny bonds, so which are called gatata. So I'm sure you know what gatata is. And then when these cells are lost, it results in swelling. And your, uh, your central corneal thickness or general corneal thickness increases in foods distribution. So when you do confocal microscopy, so that's, uh, you see these, Pumps here, and then in spectral microscopy, it's there are a few gaps you can see here as so. well. Um, so this is an, uh, another example. So on the left, you can see the slit lamp here. So a slit lamp image um, showing a uh, few gatata. When you look at um, the specular microscopy case, you can see some here. But uh, if you look at the number, the cell density, yeah, that's 2372. So still, it's, it's reasonably good. It's functioning reasonably well. And again, this is your corneal uh, thickness there. Um, and then when you go to C, that's again showing slightly more gatata. And, they, and uh, indeed, uh, comparing to with B here, there are a lot more gaps you can see so you can tell there is um it's dropped down quite a bit and as the dense cell density suggests it's 1241 so it's reduced quite dramatically from the image above going down further it's getting a bit more severe here um and it's almost hard to get a readable image or reliable image you can hardly see any cells here um and when you look at the number 682, so potentially uh, intervention is needed promptly. Um, in G, so of course you can see all uh, quite an obvious um, gatata pattern there and uh, confluent gatata in fact, and it's almost impossible to get any image whatsoever. But in, in the central area, but in mid-central, you you, uh, there is some good healthy endothelial cells available uh, or, or noticeable there. So you can, but there are still quite a few gatatas can be noticed. 
And when you look at the numbers, 2301, so it's really going to be healthy. But that's mid-central, that's not central cornea. So these imaging tools, these technology could support you in your clinical decision making to ensure at what point you need to do, um, need to refer or do uh, for any treatment. Um, so next one is posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy. So just briefly, so that's uh, a rare bilateral autosomal dominant imitative corneal dystrophy. So uh, commonly known as PP, PPMD. So you've got, uh, in, if you see uh, in retro illumination and slit lab, you can see these vesicle like lesion. And that's at the level of Desmase membrane and uh, endothelium. Uh, so that's almost the hallmark of PPMD. Um, and they are very they're transparent cystic lesions and they're surrounded by gray, gray halo. So you can see some happening here in retro. When you look at speculum microscopy, you can see this um, clearly these lesions are visible. CD1176, that's obviously quite low. When you look at the other eye, the other eye is still um, 2641, that's reasonably healthy. So again, keeping an eye, uh, keeping an eye is big on uh, uh, both eyes, it's crucial to again uh, determine when is treatment necessary or if at all, or only uh, monitoring is uh, sufficient. Um, so, iridocorneal endothelial syndrome, uh, commonly known as ICE syndrome, as the name suggests. So, it um, involves cornea, so corneal edema, iris atrophy, and of course, it results in secondary angle closure of lymphoma. Um, so in this uh, slit lamp image, you can see that I syndrome, you've got showing broad peripheral synechia. So I'm sure you know what is synechia is when the lens, uh, where the iris uh, sticks to cornea or sticks to um, the lens of the back, so into your posterior synechia. Of course, I'm talking about into synechia here. Um, and uh, you can see uh, in this uh, specular uh, microscopy, there are a few uh, gaps here. So this is showing, you see this, um, the bound, so surrounding ones, so you can see the darker regions. So it's quite different to what you see in a gatata. So the uh, so image is it's enlarged endothelial cells and the rounding of cellular boundaries and increased black heart. So it's different uh, than what you otherwise see. Um, in this image, the uh, rows, uh, the second row, it's a lot more severe. As you can see, there's a, a quite dark light reversal pattern. Um, now coming to penetrating keratoplasty, so uh, corneal surgery. So this is a uh, full thickness graft. And uh, what you see in full thickness, um, so again, a corneal transplant, full corneal transplant, um, and this is an image of uh, a transplant that was 11 uh, image uh, done 11 years ago, um, and of course it's published. Um, and uh, it's showing lower endothelial cell count, so 1248. So not the best, but function nonetheless functioning. The other eye, however, is doing extremely well. So of course, to, uh, although the cornea and slit lamp looks clear. So again, uh, it's showing that these tools, this technology can support um, your clinical decision making whether to keep, and to keep an eye to monitor this, especially these address patients as well. Again, a few more uh, PKP patients. So these are uh, 30 year old PKP graphs. When you look at the slit lamp images, they don't look very different when you look at specular microscopy again the CD here so that's the endothelial cell count again so 1144 here 731 and 689 so you can tell that there is a lot more happening in endothelium in these in these eyes um what about D6 so these are partial graphs so it's not full thickness graph so D6 so Desmond stripping endothelial keratoplasty, as the name suggests, it's for endothelium. So as I mentioned, for Fuchs dystrophy, and that's only the last, the final layer, um, innermost layer, that's uh, 
uh, that's that's transplantal fat that's D sick. Um, so when you look at uh, the image here, you can see this uh, 1623, so it's functioning reasonably well. Again, this is DSEC of uh, sick of patient, which was done 11 years ago. Um, and that paper was published uh, not in 2021, so not, not that old at all. Um, and then you see this, so in clinically, in a slit lump as well, you can see there's a lot happening in the eye, and of course, specular microscopy supports the reduced and the cell density. Of course, you've got to look at constantal corneal thickness as well, 630, so there is quite a bit of swelling fluid retention there. DALC or deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, so that's anterior um, uh, corneal transplant, anterior layer corneal transplant. Top, um, so that's generally done for um, macular corneal dystrophies that involve uh, anterior corneal layers and also sometimes DALC is done for keratoconus as well. Um, and, uh, but it's uh, quite, of course, challenging to do um, specular in these patients. Of course, as you can see, there's a lot happening. However, the post-operative image uh, and the specular supports that it's uh, not uh, much has happened in uh, endothelium, 2415. However, that's not the case always. So it's always good to do post-op um, uh, specular microscopy, of course, it's a corneal surgery. So to keep, um, to keep an eye to monitor the health of no general corneal health. So if you work in a um, in hospital, then of course, you're more likely to see that. But uh, even if you work in a, in a store, in retail setting, see things like uh, tacones or even dystrophies, it's extremely common throughout Asia. LASIK, of course, it's a very common, um, uh, you see a lot of this uh, vision correction happening these days, um, and it's been the case for quite some time. Um, and using, so this is uh, an older paper where you can see um, the presence of brightly reflective particles. And so that's in, uh, that's showing, that's around the uh, flap, uh, um, interface after LASIK surgery. So these, that's what you see in, um, in that layer. Um, and then when you look at Bowman's layer, these lines, these micro folds, they're observed after LASIK. These are quite classic signs. And another complication of LASIK that could be uh, noticed in um, slit scan and focal microscope is epithelium in growth. So this is epithelium and that's growth uh, Edward, as you can see, um, as the name suggests. Um, so again, if you keep an eye for stop of uh, several corneal uh, states, it's, it's quite a uh, useful, useful tool too. Um, cornea after PRK, so photoreflector keratectomy, uh, it's not as common in LASIK, but nonetheless, it's done quite a lot. And so this is an example of uh, well, corneal innervation, so that becomes normal. So, of course, you in PRK, especially the corneal nerves are essentially cut. Because you're, uh, so, and but that regenerates between 24 to 36 months, um, and you can um, image that. Um, again, so moving on to cell types, you see a lot of different cell types uh, in different layers of cornea. These are abnormal. Cell, cell types in many cases. I'll briefly mention about these and then we can talk about in what each infection you see that. Um, so here we've got um, leukocytes. You can see these uh, hyperreflective greasy cells. And as you can see, these are basal cells. So that's a bit clear. So we're seeing this in a bit. Okay, who thinks this is um, actually this is central cornea and these lines are actually blood vessels. So if you look closely, these dots, these are, um, you've got uh, leukocytes and you've got erythrocytes. And it's, uh, in fact, in some cases, if you have blood vessels and cornea, of course, that's neovascularization. And in that case, you actually see those individual cells, erythrocytes within 
uh, within each certain so moving within these blood vessels, which is quite interesting to see. Um, moving on to uh, C. So this one is lymphocytes. Again, so you see that in um, hyperreflective cell bodies and the tarsal conjunctiva. So, um, and we don't generally scan conjunctiva, but it's um, so done reasonably um, well, often. Um, so you can, in terms of D, so D is, of course, D is, you see, a lot. So these are dendritic cells. So these are typical spider-like dendritic cells. I'll talk about more of these cells because that's uh, almost reaction of, uh, it's almost immune response uh, to inflammation. So I'll talk more about these ones here. Moving on. So in phase of corneal ulcer, so even, um, so you may see corneal ulcer and, and it can be, very nicely imaged using um, confocal microscopy. And that's um, talking about laser scanning again, can be done using um, slit scanning as well. And looking here on the left and A, so you've got progressive phase, uh, edema of epithelium and stroma. And you can see um, superficial cells here, superficial epithelial cells here. And then you have wing cells, again, still epithelium, still in epithelium, so wing cells and basal cells here. And this one is almost, it's an oblique section. Um, that you can see all the different ways these, uh, these, these abnormal cells. You can see, again, this one, again, the inflammatory cells. And this one, uh, this is almost a healing phase. So you can see this is getting better so you're seeing normal this asterisk is saying it's the normal um intact stroma with normal keratocytes pattern almost you can see and this hyperreflection this is sign of um a scarring so then you have scarring corneal scarring that's where you see these um images like uh, this bright reflective pattern there Moving on, so acanthamoeba keratitis, as I'm sure most of you know, that's quite a common one in contact lens fear. And contact lens fear, the population, it's, it's quite high all around uh, Asia and India, of course, and all around the world, in fact. Um, and uh, it's not that uncommon to see acanthamoeba keratitis. But of course, to treat that, of course, is to scrape and um, to get the results, um, uh, pathology that, that, that takes, takes some time. However, in confocal microscopy, you can image these uh, cysts um, in, that are formed in the campanita quite distinctly. And that's quite important in terms to, to start treatment promptly because, of course, um, campanita could be a serious infection. And in, uh, so that was slit scanning. And then this one is um, laser scanning. And this way, clearly, you can see the double wall so it's called you've got half a reflective outer wall with um, bright center and the uh, astron and area. So just a slight different um, diversion from cornea to mebovin glands because I know you do um, as optometrists we see mebovin glands uh, a lot more, uh, a lot more often in detail. Um, uh, of course, cornea is important for ocular surface, and so are mobilin glands too. So um, we have we can image mobilin glands as well, and so this is uh, again from focal uh, image of a normal mobilin glands. So these are you can see the individual ASNA units, and in B you have this is a, again an image of an enlarged SNR unit, so it's fine of uh, NGD, so maybe the gland dysfunction. Another example of an overweight gland dysfunction here, you can see grade two NGD. In D here, what's happening is um, you've got atrophy here along with uh, uh, enlar enlargement um, of SNR unit. So uh, a lot of different um, sites you can image not just cornea so um now i'll briefly very briefly mention about uh systemic diseases because that's covered in previous session and as well as i've got a full bright um 
uh, Good Works seminar series that I delivered lecture in, in October. Um, so that uh, if you want a link, uh, we can uh, add the link to that, uh, where I talk in detail about relevance to systemic diseases. So just briefly, um, what so I is related to rest of the body, but to image, um, they are at the same place to monitor peripheral neuropathy. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a useful tool when you, you can use confocal microscopy to image cornea at the same point. But you can't do that, of course, for skin punch biopsy. You need to do biopsy at one point. If one location, you can't do that again at the same location. It's specifically important in diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Um, so because we know that it is one of the most common complications of diabetes. Um, so what happens is with the confocal microscopy, it, it, gives early, it provides early detection. It's fast, as we've established, and it does non-invasive, keeping in mind, we're talking about comparing with, with skin punch biopsies um, and it's objective and it is of course reliable. So we have shown previously that in, uh, in diabetes in controls, it is quite high. So again, in terms of those tracings I showed you before, and that can be done automated or semi-automated fashion. And uh, again, when, it talk, when we talk about retinopathy, of course, vision is strongly affected there at times, depending on um, severity of disease. And we do see uh, strongly correlation, a strong correlation with corneal nerve um, density as well. And that's just not shown by um, us, uh, but by different groups all over the world. And also uh, what's happening in your kidneys. So, nephropathy that can be uh, that's associated with cornea as well and uh, we published that um, a while ago and uh, so of course diabetes is not the only one that causes um, uh, peripheral neuropathy there are a number of other diseases that do cause so of course with just by assessing eye we can um, monitor a lot of the diseases other diseases as well um, so I, I mentioned about the Langerhans, uh, the inflammatory cells the, before. So these are the spider-like cells. So what are these cells? These are essentially uh, antigen-presenting dendritic cells, and they are found in epithelium of, or the peripheral cornea. But what happens, as I was mentioning before, they are from, because of corneal immune response, and in the uh, inflammatory states, they move towards the central cornea. And you see a lot of that in keratoconjunctivitis seca, so KCS, dry eye, and then it plays, uh, so essentially confocum can play, play a very important role in monitoring several systemic diseases that are associated with this. So that can be Sjogren's. Of course, Sjogren's is quite important in terms of dry eyes as well. And these um, of course, arthritis and uh, and collagen spondylitis again that's beyond the scope of this talk but again it's just to show you how um, not just the eye diseases but other diseases can be monitored using these, these tools as well um, not just for corneal nerve density but also uh, so that's for peripheral neuropathy assessment for for Langerhans cell density which is as an inflammatory markers as well so I, um, of course, I used a lot of different references, so just not my research. It's a research of a lot of other people. I would strongly, strongly recommend you all to look at these individual papers because they're extremely, um, there's a lot of data there and a lot of review papers uh, for if you want to know in depth about uh, in each of these tools um, or, or in each of these uh, dystrophies as well, if you want to know. So today, of course, we talked about um, my, uh, microscopes, specular microscopy, confocal microscopy. Um, so yes, it is diagnostic as well as research, not just research. So uh, just, uh, just to keep in mind, you can uh, use in a normal clinical settings. It's very extremely useful for many different reasons because as an optometrist, you would, you're likely to see a tampony there because of contact lens where you are, you can see keratoconus a lot again, um, in not just in hospitals, but in also in uh, possibly in the, in the private sector as well. Um, so if you want to take one thing from this talk, just remember this, what, um, if you don't have these tools, 
uh, he can convince uh, your setting to get one. That's so because it's it can be extremely useful from uh, multi, if you see a lot of keratoconus patients. Now I have I should say I have no conflict of interest to disclose, but I'm just saying this can be this, it can support in your um, uh, clinical decision making. If not that for research, it's definitely it's used quite a lot uh, worldwide. Um, and yeah, so thank you for your attention. Hopefully you have enjoyed the talk. Uh, and I'd like to finish off with a joke, uh, with an optometry joke. So, uh, so enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudhi. I think that's really uh, something which uh, is kind of uh, seldomly used, I would say. Uh, into clinical practice. We do know that researches are happening and when we read out papers, uh, we know that yes, uh, endothelium is something which is important, but very rarely used in clinical setting. And I think you did make a point that it, did, it does help you to make clinical decisions if you look at the endothelium. So it's an, probably an add-on to clinical practice uh, in terms of decision making. So thank you so much. Thank sure. you. Well, another poll, if just to see how much, yeah. uh, if if you'd like to answer that question, that would be fantastic. That's that's great. So I've launched that poll. Uh, which mm -hmm. instrument or equipment is the best use for imaging corneal subbasal nerve plexus? So do you think uh, is the laser scanning confocal microscopes, scanning laser confocal microscopes, specular or anterior segmentosity. A majority of them think laser and slit scanning confocal microscopes, mm. specular microscopes as well. But again, ASOCT AS or anterior segmentosity remains out of the league. Yes, I put this poll just to uh, make a point that uh, ASOCT, of course, it's one of the most common one. But uh, it, it gives a lot more information. I'm nothing against that. I do a lot of research in ASOCT as well. But um, in terms of looking at a cellular level, uh, it's microscope, specular microscope for endothelium. It's very important. And uh, confocal microscopes for all the layers. It's quite crucial. To look at sub-basal nerve plexus, however, laser scanning, confocal microscope is actually the, the best. You can scan the... It's possible to get images from um, slit scanning as well. You do get good images from slit scanning as well. Um, but of course, it's not possible from a uh, specular micros microscope because that's exclusively for your endothelium. So you're only looking at that, not looking at anterior layers at all. However, I mean, of course, you do, uh, looking at general health is quite important. Um, for uh, if you want to, if you have specular, and it also it's non-invasive. So that, for that purpose, specular is good, but for sub amounts, not so much. Awesome, great. While while some questions pour in, Doctor Stuti, I'm just going to ask you one one question. This is running behind my mind as well. Uh, just to know that, uh, let's say we have to make a decision. Which one should we get? into a clinical practice. So I, I know I understand you are more into academic and research setting and also you see patients, of course. Uh, but let's say a clinician, if I have an optometric clinic where I see a lot of uh, keratoconus, corneal dystrophies and all of that patients, which one, uh, according to your experience, again, uh, is something which I should invest upon? Is it a confocal slit or is it specular or mm. you think we should have everything? <laughs> Everything would be nice if you can afford for sure. Uh, but um, again, uh, which where your practice is based. So what sort of patients you see. So if you see a lot of keratoconus, then of course you're looking at scanning uh, nerves and stroma. Uh, as, so then, then you're talking more about confocal microscopes. But if you're looking at more dystrophies, so looking at Fultz dystrophies or uh, PPMD or or flag dystrophy or something, so then you are talking more about um, not so much flag, but generally for endothelial dystrophies um, or ice uh, syndrome, um, then of course, specular microscopy becomes more um, useful. And also for um, 
in terms of uh, ease of use, spectral microscopy, of course, because it's it's, it's non-invasive um, or non-contact. No, I should say okay. it's non-contact, so it's um, convenient and uh, to use as well. Um, however, if you use if you have keratoconus patients a lot, which of course is um, it's, well, it's very high in, in New Zealand, but I know it's very high in places like India and even um, South Africa, for example, as well. So um confocal microscope just uh, it can it's it can be quite useful as well so again it depends what your on your demographics what you generally see in a clinical setting and also what other tools you have at your disposal so if you already have say a topographer um then you can potentially uh, which will tell you of course uh, for catechonus it could be useful then of course you could uh, consider getting speculated it gives you a wider range so yeah, plenty the options. Okay, right. And one question we just popped up on the chat just now is uh, regarding the test. It, any of these tests which you mentioned, uh, does it require dilatation? No. Or it's in undilated state because we talk about light reflexes and all of that. So mm -hmm. do you think dilatation is an essential or pupil size? If I'm just relating it in that, mm -hmm. way, does it require that? Yeah, good, good point. Um, but no, dilatation is not important at all. So um, you can do, of course, you need, need to just uh, anesthetize the eyes, which is the standard uh, alkane, lignocane, whatever is used in your setting for IOP measurements. So as I said, it's very much, uh, it feels as from patient's perspective, it feels very much the same as uh, Goldman um, IOP measurements. So it just... Uh, and, and in fact, the area it touches is almost similar as well, if, if or maybe less than Goldman tonometry. So don't need dilatation at all. Um, but yes, um, it's uh, it, it's complete because you're looking still at the cornea, but uh, you're not going quite back there for for reflection. But but I can see, yeah, it, it can be quite confusing from that perspective. Yeah, great. All right, I think with that. Uh I, I'm seeing some thank you messages and I would like to thank you for, you know, coming up again and sharing this experience uh, and your expertise with us so that uh, now people can start thinking that you have one more tool which you can probably add on to your clinical practice uh, as most of us, as we saw our clinicians and uh, students as well who are going to be future clinicians into the diagnostic criteria settings and, and serve your patients better. We do have a session planned next weekend. Until then, take care, be safe, and I see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Sudhi. Pleasure.